Hey guys, Ryan DeShane here from Wired to Fish, and I want to talk about panfish. We're talking species like crappie, white bass, and sunfish, and you might be in part of the country where you have yellow perch available. These fish are more toward the base of the food chain, meaning they're abundant, they bite a wide variety of tackle quite readily, so they provide excellent action, and they make wonderful table fare. I'm gonna go through six rigging setups that are gonna help you catch panfish no matter where you live. Before I get into each bait category and how we rig it, guys, I just wanna talk about rod, reel, and line. Generally speaking, for most panfish applications, a light power and a medium light power rod in that six foot to seven foot six range is gonna work excellent for you. A lighter rod allows you to detect bites from smaller fish. And when it comes to reels, we like to run spinning reels in a size 50 or 500 all the way up to a size 2500 or size 25, depending on the manufacturer. This one happens to be a small size 50 reel, and that works well. The one thing you'll gain on a bigger arbored spinning reel is better line management. You can see here that you're gonna have tighter coils here, and with some types of lines, such as monofilament or fluorocarbon, you'll have more memory as a result. You can see this reel here. This is a 2500 size. That has a bigger spool and bigger coils. So that's something to consider. When it comes to line, light line is the name of the game for panfish. Generally speaking, a four, six, or eight pound test in both monofilament, fluorocarbon, and braid will be pretty light and allow you to deliver small presentations. Open water situations, go with the lighter line. You get around heavy cover, you may need that horsepower afforded by braid and fluorocarbon. So just adjust to your conditions. Keep in mind that this list isn't gonna be all inclusive. Just like anything, there's niche stuff that works better in certain situations. But this lineup of panfish setups along with some of these core tackle categories are gonna serve you well. The first category I wanna talk about is a jig. Now a jig consists of a head and then it's attached to a hook. One thing you'll notice with jigs is there is no bobber, so we have excellent depth control. You can cast out, let that bait sink down to the depth that you feel the fish are at, and then work it horizontally. Likewise, you can drop it straight below the boat if you happen to see fish on your sonar and engage those fish vertically just below the boat. A jig is designed to receive something, such as live bait, it might be a minnow, it could be a worm, or as is our preference at Wired to Fish, plastic in a lot of circumstances. A couple things to keep in mind when you go jig fishing is to size the jig appropriately to the fish you're chasing. Bluegill, for example, have much smaller mouths than crappie. So we tend to favor downsized jigs in that 1 16th, even down to a 32nd ounce size in small microplastics that mimic invertebrates in the water column. But you may be from part of the country where shad are a primary forage for crappie. That's when you want to upsize to bigger plastics or even use minnows. And we use a combination of both quite often. If you have a plastic and live bait combo, if the fish takes the live bait off, you'll oftentimes still have a bait in play as long as there's a plastic there. You can take a look at my board over here and see the huge variety of plastics and jigs that are available. And the combinations are really endless. Curly tail grubs are a common plastic that have been used for ages. This one happens to be a little invertebrate with little flagella off the back end. You can have fun with these baits. The other type of jig you need to consider is hair jigs. A lot of mass market varieties available that you can find at your local tackle shop, but there are also a lot of custom ones. Pretty easy to tie. One of my colleagues, Jason Seelock from Wired to Fish, he's an avid crappie angler, and he does a ton of custom fly tying. The nice thing here is you never have to rebate. You never have to readjust a plastic if the fish pulls the plastic down. And they have a very lifelike action in the water column. Let's talk about bobbers, and this is how a lot of us got our start in fishing. There's nothing more enjoyable than casting out a cork, watching it go down, and it truly is one of the best ways to catch fish. You're suspending a bait vertically in their face, and that's a very natural thing. But not all bobbers are created equally. I have a couple different bobbers on the deck that I want to talk about. One is a longer stemmed slip bobber, such as this one here. And a slip bobber is what it says. It slides on the line, I have a jig on here, I have a weight that sinks to the bottom, and this slip bobber slides through the line until a bobber stop catches it. So I can set this type of bobber at any depth that I want. Oftentimes panfish are set up deep, so you need a slip bobber in order to get the bait in front of them. Let's just say a deep brush pile, for example. 
Couple different styles of bobbers. Again, this one's a little taller, it's a little bit bigger. That means it's more buoyant. So if I'm fishing bigger panfish or I'm fishing a heavier jig, I might be in wind conditions, for example. I need a heavier weight and a heavier bait to get down to the bottom, so I need a more buoyant bobber. And I also need something that I can see when I cast out away from the boat. So what you might put on the business end of here, a jig, a bare hook, could be a plastic on that jig, could be a hair jig, could be a jig with a piece of worm or a minnow, whatever the fish happen to have a preference for on any given day. This is a different style of slip bobber here. You can see it's a little bit more short and squat. If I'm targeting bluegill, I might want a slip bobber that has less resistance so the fish don't feel it and let go when they pull it under. So just a smaller bobber. This one happens to be made of balsa. I have a little inline swivel connecting braid to a small shank of six pound fluorocarbon leader and a 1 16th ounce jig on this side. This would be a bluegill setup that I would use. And again, this is a slip bobber. So I have a little control of my depth. If I want to fish it deeper, 5, 10, 15, 20 feet of water, I can. And here's the lesser used but really effective variation of a slip bobber setup. This one has no weight. Instead, I'm using the weight of the jig as my weight. Why this is beneficial is, let me go ahead and pull up. When I'm casting, we're often making little casts in and around cover, such as bulrushes or weeds or trees. By penduluming this in or casting this into little pockets, I don't have a long shank of line going like that. So you can get this into spots very accurately. And just in general, you have less hardware. So it's a very elegant presentation. Cast out, let a little 1 16th ounce or even a 32nd ounce jig go down, a little piece of plastic on the business end. And this is an excellent way to catch finicky fish in and around cover. And then the last bobber setup I want to talk about is simply a clip on float. And that's probably the most common in the simplest. Now I don't have one rigged right now, but I'm just gonna take this line here, shift that slip bobber up, clip on float, just gonna grab a little bobber here, and there's a spring inside, you depress the spring, and then there's a little clip on each side. There you go, I mean, how simple is that? There's a couple different types of those bobbers. There's these short and squat ones. Oftentimes you'll have a little lead weight on there to make casting easier and then longer stem ones, again, to help with visibility. Both work well. This one might be a little surprising to some folks, but the drop shot that is so popular in bass fishing also excels for panfish in some specific situations. Let's say I'm fishing bluegill on their beds. I cast out there, this weight down at the bottom sinks right down. I have a dropper of a set length off of the bottom. In this case, I'm set about a foot and a half to a hook with a piece of plastic or a piece of live bait. I get precision depth control, I get down fast, and I'm working that bait at a set distance off of the bottom. Stays in the face of the fish, assuming they're more bottom oriented, and I can cover water pretty quickly. The other thing is for bottom oriented fish, I'm just gonna change the length of the dropper as necessary to where the fish are positioned off bottom. So if the fish are six inches off bottom, I'm gonna have my weight here. If the fish are a foot and a half off the bottom, I'm gonna give myself a foot and a half dropper. When it comes to the actual hook, feel free to use a jig. Uh, regular hook, such as this little octopus hook, this is a number eight or an Aberdeen style for bluegill works great. Put on a plastic, live bait, whatever you want, but you're gonna have a lot of success with this setup. The other thing is, is if I'm fishing in an area where there's a change of depth and the fish are scattered around, I'd have to constantly be changing my slip bobber or my fixed float to the depth. I don't have to do that with this setup. On the weight side of things, I carry a few different varieties in my boat. If I'm fishing weedy areas, I prefer this little cylinder because it slides through cover with ease. If I'm in an area that's more rock and gravel, you might want to go with a teardrop style, such as this one here. Because I'm using a smaller diameter line when I'm chasing panfish, I also do a few half hitch knots over the top and draw that down tight. And you won't have any problem with that weight slipping off. You'll be surprised with how predatory certain panfish are. Crappie, white bass, heck, even bluegill. And what do aggressive fish like to eat? Spinner baits. This is a little safety pin style spinner with a jig attached. And a lot of folks are pretty familiar with the beetle spin. It's a classic presentation. So simple here. This one happens to be a jig with a little curly tail grub. 
The beauty of this setup is you can cast it out and fish it pretty clean around wood, around weeds, and cover water in search of fish. Panfish will swim a lot and cover water in search of feeding opportunities, so you need to cover water in order to find the schools of fish. This is a great way to cast out, work a weed line, give the fish a little bit bigger profile with some added flash and vibration. That can really pay dividends if you're fishing some dirty water or when you're dealing with the bigger class of fish or just in general, more aggressive fish. Spinners also come in an inline variety and I have one here. It's a little Roadrunner style. So I can use that safety pin around cover, but if I'm in a more open water situation, I might just wanna have this little road runner here, cast it out, sink it down to the depth the fish are at, slow wind it in. So you might be a person that likes to fish hair jigs or tie your own jigs, for example. So in this situation, simply choose a jig that you think's right for the size of the fish and the depth you're fishing, slide on that safety pin style spinner, hook it up and cast it out. Fun way to fish, it's also gonna catch a bunch of bass for you. So it makes it a great setup for getting kids into fishing and just having a bunch of action. For those of you that may want to try tactics that are a little less used, but work exceptionally well, particularly for really big fish, consider hard baits. And I have a variety of them over here. We're talking lipless crankbaits, jerk baits, micro crankbaits, and even spy baits. These are all common baits for bass, but crappie have pretty big mouths. They're a real sucker for hard baits. But you can see I have a wide variety of sizes here too. So this is a tiny little lipless crankbait. Excellent bait for bluegill. When we go to crappie, we like to step up to a little bit bigger size lipless crankbait. Different styles of lipless crankbaits have different widenesses of wobble, as well as different sound characteristics. But these are great triggering baits. And you'd be surprised at how well you can fish them in and around cover like standing weeds, or even brush. This little spy bait's a great bait if you can see crappie and you can pitch it into cover, let it sink down like this, and then just work it horizontally. Pull, let sink, pull, let sink. And definitely one of our favorites is a common jerk bait in the small size. We're talking four or six centimeter baits, but these things are awesome for triggering crappie, especially during the springtime when they're guarding nests. They get very aggressive about any forage or bait fish coming into their area. And down south, it's real common to troll crankbaits. And these can be cast as well, but crankbaits are another excellent option. This one has a little bit bigger lip here, but big crappie love eating a bait like that. Which leads me to our last setup here. And this is a category that encompasses a couple varieties of baits. I happen to have a horizontal jigging spoon on now. This is a Rapala jigging wrap. And this thing has really expanded beyond what it was originally intended for, which was ice fishing, to become an open water bait for walleye and panfish. It's a heavier bait, so you have a lead body, and this thing is affixed with a nose hook, a hook off the rear, and a treble hook on the bottom. We like jigging wraps or horizontal jigging spoons, there's a number of them on the market, extremely well in the fall months when panfish set up in deeper basin areas or over deep brush piles. You can get it down quickly to the fish, and when you jig it, it has a really cool darting action that's an excellent trigger. Simply size the jigging wrap to the mood of the fish and as well as the size of the fish. You can take a look at my board over there and see that they come in small sizes, starting with a two centimeter, three centimeter. You can get a five centimeter on up to a seven or even nine. But generally speaking, we focus a lot of energy using that number two, that two centimeter for bluegill, and then a size three and five for crappie. And similar to a jigging wrap, but quite a bit different in style and how they're fished, are spoons, flutter spoons, as well as more slab style spoons. And a flutter spoon is designed to flutter basically on the fall. So they're a lot thinner by design. They take longer to sink to the bottom, so it's not one that we favor in real deep water situations. But if you know where the fish are and you have the patience, you cast it out, let it sink to the bottom, and it gives off a lot of flash and vibration as it goes through the water column. Common in ice fishing, but also a good tool for open water fishing situations, particularly when you have fish below the boat set up on a brush pile. And then a slab style spoon is just a thicker bodied bait that doesn't have quite the flash and flutter on the fall. Sometimes they have a rattle chamber such as this one. They're very efficient at getting down deep. And the one thing we'll do with these style of baits is put a little piece of plastic 
or just as often a little bit of meat, like a minnow head or a piece of worm on that treble hook to give fish a target. And I do want to hit up on terminal tackle, particularly with these hard bait lures as well as these other deeper jigging lures is we like to stock a good variety of barrel swivels as well as snaps. The barrel swivels really help for reducing line twist and then the snaps allow us to change out baits quickly. It's good to experiment a lot. You'll often find that the fish have a size or color or action preference. So you're more apt to change baits if you don't have to constantly be retying. Hey guys, thanks for sitting through this. And these six setups are confidence presentations and rod and reel pairings for uh, some of the wire to fish staff. So we hope that you find one or two that work well for your fishing situation.